morning, church. Good to see you. Happy Sunday. Whee! You made it. Made it through another week. That was awesome. I needed that. By the way, thank you, Elliot, for covering for Brother Jason, being out of town. Great job. Thank you, guys. What you may not know is that early this morning, that projector died. So he was flying completely solo and blind. No, no confidence monitor, no words or nothing. So that was, that's all. I've done that once before. <laughs> once. And you don't want to do that again. So it was so sweet to hear the children. We're singing that last verse, I am a child of God. And there's so many kids in here today because Children's Church on the fifth Sunday meets with us. And there is some good singing coming from these little nards over here. And this second row right here had some good voices coming through. I could not trying to embarrass anybody, but they were singing in my ears. I love it. And we need that because that restores us. Worship is restorative, which leads perfectly to rest in what we're talking about. I got to share with you a, a painfully embarrassing and transparent story. A couple weeks ago, we're in here, all the chairs are cleared, all the chairs are cleared, and we're sweating, and we're working out, we're doing the cardio thing, we got refit going, it is grueling, and it is soul-scorching hard, and we're having a great time, and I've sweat 47 pounds off, and, and we're just having this great time, and we finished, and I'm just, if I could just get through the last song, I know we do a devotional, and I can breathe, and we always circle up, about 45, 50 of us, we circle up, we have this devotional, we have a prayer time, it's a great time, and Tina, our fearless leader, who by the way usually sits over here, she's sick today, shout out to Tina. She, uh, something was up because she said, don't circle up. I want y'all to line up. I was like, oh, this, I should have known right then something was wrong. She says, I have a, I have a question I want to ask each of you. It was a very probing question, a very revealing question, one that I don't think any of us were very comfortable answering out loud, but it was one of those questions we had to answer by standing wherever our answer was. For instance, she would ask the question, don't put it up yet, Ryan, but she would ask three different questions. And if your answer was this, you had to stand over here with this group. But if your answer was this, you had to stand here in the middle of the room. And if your answer was the other, you had to stand over here. Okay? So keep that in mind. Very probing question. Y'all curious to know what the question was? The question was, what do you struggle with most? Well, that's just awesome. I love to lead with my faults. I love to begin a job interview with, let me share how I'm weakest. So the first question she put up was, how many of you struggle most with this one right here? Eating healthy. Well, half the room right there just started walking right on over to this. We stood there because that's tough. Eating healthy is hard. We try. We mean well. But those Chicken McNuggets, call your name. And it's just, it's tough. It's tough to say no to the Frosties and stuff. And I was like, okay, this is where I'm going to stand. And then she said, how many of you struggle more with this? Exercising regularly. Well, half the room walked right over here, myself included. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm exercising. I've always lifted weights, but I'm going to try to exercise. But that wasn't the question. The question was, what do you struggle with? And that's a struggle. That's a struggle for me to get my family up, to come to refit and do those two, two hours of cardio and then... And then, you know, try to just, it, it, it's hard. It takes intentionality. There is no end to the amount of excuses I can find of why I don't need to go to that. You know what I'm saying? But my doctor says, oh, Matt, you need, you need to, your cholesterol is little high. You need to bring it down. That's Dr. Shaw. If you have him, you know, I love him. He's awesome. I was like, okay, this is where I need to stand, right here. That's the question. And then she put up the third question, which was this one right here. Resting prop. Oh, my goodness. I guess I'm going to walk over here now. I was like, is there, a, is there like a yes to all the above? Is there like a yes? Can I just put like one foot here and a hand here like twister and be in all three? Because we struggle with that. We all do, especially in our society today. That last one, we think it's so innocuous. No big deal. But it is a big deal, y'all. We don't look very redeemed many days. And the lost world looks at us and, you know, I wonder what kind of God do they see when they look at us? Do they see a God that never lets you rest? Or do they see a God that is redeeming you? And you're full of peace and energy and stamina. Or are you just dragging yourself along? Help me, Lord. I just got to get out of the bed. I, in fact, I might need help getting up, Elliot. Okay, I got it. Okay. And that's the question. I got to thinking about this and I think we all struggle with this. Life has a rhythm, and we need to find that. And we see it. God established this from the very beginning. He rested after laboring six days, making all that we see. And then he set a day of rest aside and invited us to join him in it. But 
we don't. So many times I think we plow right through this divine, heavenly stop sign he has for us, and we're like, we don't need it. We're good. We can blow through, because what do we say? Let's be honest. We think if we can just work a little bit longer, if I could just work through this weekend, I'll be caught up. Yeah, you're laughing because you've been, if I could just stay up a little later, baby, I'll, I'll be to bed soon, but I got to do that. I can't go see the kids do that. I, I got I to gotta work through the weekend. You know what? I got to work through lunch again. If I could just stay up a little later and then I'm going to get up earlier this week, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to take that week off. I'm going to plow straight through it because I think at the end of this, there's a rainbow and a pot of gold and a little leprechaun who's going to reward me and say, you're finished. There's only one problem with that. You're never caught up. Can I get an amen? amen? You're never caught up. The work is never done. You're never to the point. I can't, I mean, if you've ever been there, please tell me. But I have never gotten to the end of it and go, wow, that's, I am so bored. There's nothing left to do on this planet. And you probably haven't gotten that way either, right? It's just, that's a lie. You are never, here's the deal. You're going to rest. It's just going to be, is it going to be on your choice or is it going to be a divine appointment that has caused you flat on your back? Here's the problem with always being on. The always on lifestyle is very likely going to be switched off prematurely. You can count on that. Whether it's a divine appointment with the hospital bed or exhaustion, or you are so cranky that your spouse looks at you and says, you need to, get, oh, you need to take a nap. <laughs> like, so, wow, you're really laughing at that one, huh? I struck a nerve. Who knew? I think so many times we buy into this lie that it's like a holy badge of honor to go and go and go and be exhausted. Know what I'm saying? Especially in this day and age. Last week, we looked at some steps to hearing God's voice. And one of the steps I didn't get into because we just didn't even have time was, I think one of the main reasons we fail to hear his voice is because we are always on. We're always multitasking, right? It's not enough now just to do your job. You've got to be like spinning a plate over here and you know, doing something over here, and you're, you're having a great time. You feel like a circus panda. That, that pandas and circus, circus bear, whatever. And you're doing all these things, and things are just going crazy. And we're shocked when we fail to hear God speak to us. It's like this comic right here. I love this. Notice this guy. He's got his, he's got his earbuds in. He's got his, he's got his iPad, his iPod, whatever that is. He's listening to his little tunes and monitors blaring at him. And what you probably can't see is right over here on the wall is a giant flat screen with Netflix streaming the latest movie to him. And over here, you've got probably some kind of distraction thing. Somebody's texting him, his pocket's exploding because it's vibrating with all these text messages. And I bet if we could pull back, this would be one of those goofy desks that's a standing desk. And this guy is probably on a treadmill this whole time, just doing it. And he looks up and says, I can't hear you, God. What is wrong with us? This might hit a little too close to home for some of us because we have bought into the lie that being productive equals being spiritual. And that is not always the truth. Here's your first truth grenade for today. Before we even get to read the scripture, to hear God's voice, you got to turn down the world's volume. you got to turn down the world's volume. It, it, it will drown you out. Now hear me, there is nothing inherently wrong with being a hard worker. Nothing at all. There's nothing wrong with multitasking by itself. Here's the deal. I mean, Jesus was a hard worker. He pushed himself sometimes to to meet the needs of the people. That's awesome. We should do that. We should have bursts of sprint level speed. We just don't maintain that for a marathon. Even Jesus showed the example and pulled away. You can see countless times he disappeared. He went up on the mountains to pray, to have not just sleep, not just do nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's okay in its proper place, but restorative rest in him. I am so thankful that he gets it. See, our shepherd, Jesus, uses this metaphor over and over because he understands that we need these grassy meadows that we can come lie down and rest. And I'm not just referring to sleep, okay? Hear me say that. I'm talking about genuine biblical rest, which can lead to amazing times of worship and connecting with God that restores our soul. Be honest with yourself. Answer this question. Do you need that? Yeah, <laughs> we've got some real honest people saying out loud, that's awesome. You're safe here. I need that. In fact, I am going to take my own advice. As I was preparing this, God convicted me. Sometime in the next five days, I'm going to disappear. I don't even know where I'm going, but I'm going to just rest in him. 
and I'm going to let him give me the next year's worth of vision and, and have that recharging and, and think about the next step because there's some exciting things on the horizon, and I just want to get alone and, and hear with him. I don't even know who's going to preach Sunday. It's going to be somebody good, though. That's how fresh this is, okay? So know that every time I preach, it's not for you. It's for me. God is dealing with me first. When we have these times of corporate worship and we gather and we can rest in him like we just had, we're singing and we're doing, man, that restores the body. That's the first step. And you guys did it. You're here today. That's fantastic. We had to put out overflow chairs over there. I love the fact that you guys know this is the way to start your week. There's a great quote here by Richard Clark Cabot. He says this, worship renews the spirit as sleep renews the body. Wow, what a profound quote. So with that as our table, our table is set. Dive in with me onto the scripture. Psalm 23, turn there, pull up one of the famous passages of all time. Psalm 23, while you pull that up, let me welcome those who are streaming with us too. It's great to have you. And we'll read, we're gonna read the whole thing because I just love this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Oh, man, I love that. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a beautiful picture of these pastors and the shepherd coming. I want to focus on these first two verses. Go back here, Ryan. Let me see verse 1 and 2. When I was a kid, this, this always confused me. Did anyone else think this? Here we have this great declarative statement. The Lord is my shepherd. Woo, yeah. And in the next phrase, it says we don't want him. Did anybody else see that? Was I the only weird kid? I was like five years old. I'm like, Mom, I don't get it. Why is he my shepherd? And I said, I don't want. I don't want him. I said, no, 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 no. That means the Lord is my shepherd. And because he is, you shall never be in want. Pfft, wow, you're so smart. That's incredible. That changes everything. So we do want the shepherd. Then I had to kind of grasp that. I'm like, the Lord is my shepherd, and because he is, I shall not want. Do you know what shepherd literally translated as? It's the word rohi. The Hebrew word there is rohi. You may have heard it if you study the names of God, Jehovah rohi or Yahweh rohi. That literally means the Lord, my shepherd. Like this shepherd who was protecting us, who was hugging us. David knew God cared for him just like David cared for his sheep. His sheep, which are so goofy, and they just, they don't, they're just not smart. They're not. They'll fall over, and they'll sit there with their legs in the air, and they don't know what to do. And if you don't come over and tip them back up, it's like reverse cow tipping, they'll die. They will die. That's it. The bad news is we're compared with them <laughs> because we need a shepherd. And God knew that. And this, remember last week we talked about the dog park? How if you go and your dog's really trained, you could call your dog and he knows your voice, he knows your name, and, and he'll come to you. Sheep are the same way. When shepherds are able to take their flocks out, they could take them to the market. They could mingle with an, another sheep pasture in a big flock out there. They could call their name, and the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice. And they turn and they follow him. What a beautiful illustration. No wonder Jesus uses this as a great symbol, this, this beautiful spiritual metaphor. John 10 says this, and I love this. Read it with me. It says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But we do not hear his voice. We do not know his will. We do not follow him if we can't hear it. If we're so stinking busy, sometimes youngins, busy, looks like this. Just saying. If we can't hear his voice, how do we follow him? How do we know what true rest is? He says, hey, come with me. Come lie down. I know you're weary. I know you're heavy laden. Come over here. We can't do it because we're too busy doing these things. The more you recognize his voice and the Spirit's leading, the more you'll see how important this is. There was a beautiful devotional by Mary Sutherland, and she said, rest is not an option. And I love how she quoted this one line. She says, don't wait for God to grab your attention with an illness that drives you to bed or a crisis that drives you to your knees. Because your father is a persistent heavenly father, he knows the value of rest. And that's why Jesus modeled it. Jesus took Sabbath moments all the time where he stopped and he heard the voice of the father. And then he told us to do it. He even did it in the creation process. Let me ask you this. Did God need to rest? Negative. He didn't need it. He was showing us the example. 
Because he knew us. He could already step forward and see. He occupies past, present, future at the same time. And he sees, make no mistake, we will rest one way or the other. So let me ask you, how you doing? How you doing? If you had to give yourself the number, you know I love it. Let's get practical. Take out your little post-it note, your invisible post-it note, and write your number. On a 1 to 10, how good at you are at truly following biblical rest? You're 2? You're 7? That's a beautiful passage. Don't miss this. Psalm 22, two, or 23, 2 says this. It says, he makes me lie down. I love that. He makes me. Sometimes God needs to almost impose and say, guys, I want to remind you, come follow me. I want you to rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. For some of us, we have wrongly equated being busy with being productive and being spiritual. Trust me, I am right there with you in living life in overdrive. Being a pastor, this is the most awesome thing I've ever done. It is the hardest thing I've ever done, especially when God surprised me with a newborn right in the middle of it. I'm like, wow, I thought I was done with that 20 years ago, certainly 10 years ago. And I mean, it's, it's easy to get into the overdrive trap. I see it in your eyes. So hear me, I'm not just trying to speak down and say things I don't know about. I am right there with you. We are so messed up where we somehow revere crowded schedules and chronic fatigue as some kind of holy medal of spirituality that we should wear. And again, we look at our lost neighbors and they look at us and they go, I don't want that. I can see it in your eyes. I can see how tired you are. Why would I want to be like that neighbor? See what I'm saying? We send a confusing message to the people we're trying to lead to the kingdom. Hey, follow me, come to the shepherd, it's gonna be awesome, and you can look haggard and awful like me. <laughs> Who's with me? Are we serious? This, y'all, it's almost as if we think rest is for the weak, and exhaustion is for the holy. Don't believe me? Most of us grew up singing this exact sentiment. Okay, this will reveal what age group you grew up in. Are you ready? Okay? I'm going to quote the great theological band known as Def Leppard. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Right? You know, raise your hand if you've heard that song. Yeah, that's what I thought. We, now we don't say, we, oh, pastor, I don't believe that. I, we, don't, we don't sing those words. Well, some of us do. And by the way, you need to repent of that because that was from my old life and we don't listen to that kind of music. But some of us live this. We may not say it with our words. We think burnout is something spiritual. And we stock our calendars and our schedules so full that there's no room for anything. If God asked you to do something for the kingdom, you'd be like, can't do it. <laughs> Sorry, you should have gotten on my calendar, God. Oh, we don't say that with our voice, but we say it with our actions as if burnout is some kind of holy goal. Learning to rest demands an understanding of several basic truths. If you got your pen, you want to write these down. The first one is this. Rest is sacred. God ordained it. Don't forget that. Don't buy into the lie that if you rest, you're weak. He ordained it. He showed us that we're supposed to do it. It is the most spiritual thing we can do sometimes. And you don't have to apologize for it. There's nothing weak about it. The human body is programmed for a certain amount of rest. Yes, you can cheat it for a little bit, but it will catch up to you in the long term. The next one we need to understand, rest is replenishing. Woo, yeah, I like that. That's why Jesus showed this. When we rest, the Father repairs us and restores us, especially when it's spiritual rest, rest that is good. When I'm tired and my batteries have worn down and I don't take the time to recharge them, do you know I make poor decisions? Do you know my fuse is shorter? Y'all remember this when we talk about relationships in March. When do most arguments occur? At the end of the day, when one or both spouses are tired or hungry or both, in which case you're hangry, right? That's when they happen. We make bad decisions when we cannot rest because rest is what it, it, it restores us, it replenishes us, and stressful times demand a replenished body. How you doing, church? How are you doing with this? Embrace your rest time. Protect it so you can replenish. Because how we handle stress leads to the next part. How we handle our rest, rest reduces stress, and that is the good part. That's what we're, we're looking at today. I go to Dr. Shaw. Oh, I got my meeting coming up with him, and I'm just so excited. Can't wait to see him. Because as I've gotten older, the tests have gotten much more elaborate and invasive. <laughs> oh, thank you. I feel your solidarity with me. My doctor tells me that stress can be a good thing or a bad thing. Doctors say that. And, and maybe that's true. 
But I don't know about you, but most stress in my life is not the kind I would say, that's good, I love it, bring more, right? Stress to me is a bad thing. But doctors say, and Elijah does give us an example of good stress. When he's one day the conquering hero and he's having an awesome time and he's victorious in battle, the next we see him sitting under a juniper tree begging God, just let him die. What happened? He was exhausted. The poor guy was exhausted. Now, he was exhausted from victory, from battle. That was awesome. But he was exhausted nonetheless, and he needed rest. And this great guy goes, just let me die. You ever been there? <laughs> it happens. It's okay. You're safe here. You can admit it. That's why we're all here. Which leads to the last one. Rest eliminates fatigue, and that's just what Elijah was dealing with. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. Fatigue is not a spiritual gift. Okay? Say it with me. Fatigue is not a spiritual gift. It's not a badge of honor you get to wear. Look how fatigued I am. Well, I just want to pray for you, right? I don't want to emulate that. We have to lead by example here. This is, it is not a, a, a badge of honor to wear dark circles under our eyes and bloodshot eyes and look like we've been out drinking all night. That is not the godly representation we're called to be, which brings us to a spiritual paradox. You ready for your mind twister, the thing that is incongruous here? Here's your spiritual paradox for the week. We need to rest most when we have the least amount of time to do it right? When you feel your schedule closing in, man, that's when you need to rest the most. Don't cheat it. Man, you need to elbow it out like a guard when playing basketball. Get back. This is my rest, and I'm not apologizing for it. It's almost like we, 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 we think it's fun to, to avoid the grassy meadows. What are we doing? God says, come apart. Lie down in green meadows with me, and hey, I will transform your meaningless, ceaseless, endless activity into something that is thriving and powerful. We need to stop, be still, and rest. Rest in God. Hear me. God is giving you permission to get off the crazy train. Okay? You're thinking it. Dun dun. Dun dun. Dun dun. I, I, I. Right? And for those keeping record at home, for those keeping score at home, yes, Pastor Matt did a Def Leppard and an Aussie reference in the same sermon. That just happened. This is where we live. This is. The Lord is giving us an invitation to take our life back from the crazy train, to take it from craziness and endless busyness. You can take a Sabbath, a restful time to clear the deck without apology, without guilt, without shame, for no better reason than God said you could. Boom! Let that sink in. You don't have to feel bad. Oh, I can't do that. Why? Because You know what? Because God told me I could take a rest. Hear that? I see some of you pointing to other people. <laughs> it's okay. We can point to everybody on this one we got to lead by example here. It's okay to take it. The actual Hebrew word for Sabbath is Shabbat. You know what it means? It means day of rest. Not minute, not catnap, day of rest. It comes from the verb Shabbat, which actually means cease your exertion. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. I want some more. To quote Oliver Twist, can I please have some more? I'll take a double portion of this. Cease my exertion, and we say no? What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? Here's the beautiful part. This, this gift of rest is not something you have to earn. It's yours. It's a present. Rest is a gift, and you don't have to earn it. It is there for you. It is something that he gives you, not because you finished your chores, not because your work was done and you get a gold star and he gives you a little present. He says, open it. It's some rest for you. It's the rest you get to take smack dab in the middle of your work that is never done. Let that sink in because that's what changed me. You know what? My work's never going to be done. But God said, you need your rest. You need to recharge your batteries. And I know where the recharging station is. Come follow me. Bring your Prius and we'll plug in here together and we will recharge our batteries together. That is a beautiful thing. We can do this without apology and guilt and shame. None of that because God said we could. So when somebody comes, hey, I think you're being awful lazy today, you can say, take it up with God. He told me I could. You don't have to defend this. If all Christians observed true rest, the lost world would be so envious of us. They would come, they'd be banging down your door going, what is different about you? Can I have some? Truth? True story. All right, pastor, I get it. So how do we rest? What is this about? What, how do we even honor the Sabbath? Can we do anything on the Sabbath? Or do we have to lock ourselves in a dark room 
with sparse furniture, an oak table, and an awkward stool that's uncomfortable, you know, the backless kind where you have to really actually sit up straight, and just a, a dim candle in your King James Bible. If you're really spiritual, you have a hymnal, because everybody has a hymnal at home, right? The 1975 Baptist edition. And you sit there, is this what we have to do? Do we have to shun all modern conveniences and become Amish for the day? No. <laughs> no, that's not what God's saying. By the way, we, we looked. Ryan found an awesome picture. We found uh, Yoda's Amish cousin, Yoder, here. So if you were looking for where his cousin is, we found him. has nothing to do with the message. Just wanted you to see him. We, this is not about going back in time. And <laughs> Archie liked that. I can see that. This is not about going back in time. This is not about becoming Amish for the day or Mennonite, maybe getting close to it. This is not about that. Jesus himself addressed this. You ready for this? You ready for your walking truth grenade? Jesus is walking through the fields, and there's grains popping up everywhere, and he's hungry. It just happens to be a Sabbath. Guess what he does? He reaches over. He's got his disciples with him. He grabs some grains and rubs them, starts popping the grains, and now starts eating them. And on cue, there's a gang of bad people. It's like they were hiding in the grain, ready to pop up and say, gotcha. This group that loves to harangue him, has always harassed him, harasses him yet again. His favorite group, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are there, and if you've ever seen West Side Story, I tell you, this is how I picture it. I picture the jets, and you got the sharks, and these guys hop up, and they're like, yo, Jesus, what you doing? <laughs> Saw you picking the grains, right? If you've ever seen the musical, right? It's the, it's the most, who talks like that? And you see this other guy, like this little pipsqueak going, hey, what you doing? You're picking the grains. What? That's bad. And then you see the disciples gather around like, when you're a jet, you're a jet for life. And they defend Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what? I got this. I got this, guys. And he says the most beautiful, he just, he just cuts them off at the knees with such a beautiful statement. Listen to what he says here in Mark 2. He says, <clears throat> friends, the Sabbath was made for man. Not man, but the Sabbath. And their song just stopped. What does that mean? You know what that means? You know, in other words, he's saying the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people. The people God loves. The people my father loves. Not the other way around. He didn't make people to fill this bizarre legalistic requirement for Sabbathing. That's not what he did. Woo! Is that my daughter? No? Is that Owen? No? Okay. All right. Okay. I was going to say high five. Good to see you, too. They are sitting here, and they are having this beautiful moment, and even the babies are loving it. Jesus is showing us right by this beautiful truth grenade in the middle of a grain field that this is not about a legalism quest for perfection. Hear me. Hear Jesus when he says this. You need a day of rest to recharge in him. And right there, Jesus says, guys, come with me who are weary. You're heavy laden. Come on, I will give you rest. It's so sweet. Jesus reveals the secret right there, and that's this. Know the difference between work, play, and rest. If we can't define that, you'll never have an easy time wondering where that line is. Can I be honest? Confession time? This is hard for me. You know why? Because I love what I do. Some of you have been very good. You've come up to me, and in your gentle way, rebuked your pastor. You're up here too much. You're out there too much. You do it. You, you need to, I don't like this. We drive by. The lights are still on. Like, what is this? You're camping in your office with air mattresses. That, is, that can't be good. You know, I, we don't do that a lot, but just sometimes to get ahead. And the kids love it. We have to, this is so hard for many of us, especially if you kind of enjoy what you do. This is where it can get out of control. This is where we can lose it. Because here's what we do. On our day off, we try to be utilitarian and productive even on our day off, right? We work ahead. We read books related to work to get ahead. We read things like how to be better in this area, or we slave away at the gym trying to get a little bit better here, or we practice our golf. We even call it practicing our golf. That's okay if that's something you truly enjoy for rest and restoring, but not if it's something that is, is part of your, uh, just another form of work. See what we're doing? We're trying to be productive even in our rest pursuits. What is wrong with us? Do you see how far we've drifted? from God's ultimate plan. Only when you stop and you have somebody pointed out does it really leap off the page. So 
if you're part of the people for centuries who have argued how to define rest and you're not sure, I'm going to give it to you in one sentence. Get your pens ready. It's that good. Are you ready? Okay, this is profound. It's deep. Here's how you define it. Decide what work is for you and don't do it. Don't do it, especially on your Sabbath. Decide what work is for you and that's a no-go. Put it in a box and say, I can't do that today. I've had to do that. I have to do that with my family. You know, do my kids see a guy who never turns off the clock? Who always goes, goes, goes? They'll be second, they'll be third, they'll be there. Or yeah, you know what? I turn around and they're grown. It happens. As your pastor, as your friend, protect your rest. You're better for it. I promise, I promise, I promise, I won't think you're less spiritual for it. I will applaud you. Okay? Now, if your rest is going to the beach every weekend for 48 weekends in a row, I don't applaud that. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your spiritual Sabbath where you still come together and you worship with people and you know the difference. One of the marks of excellent rest and leisure is doing something we love because it's infused with gratitude and praise towards God. God is whispering a secret to us, and it's almost like we don't want to hear it. He's saying, guys, I made you and your battery will run down. And I'll show you where the recharging station is, but you've got you to gotta put down that iPad. You've got you to gotta turn off that Striper CD, dude. You've got to follow me. So, see, I include me in there. You've got too much noise going on in your head. You've got to follow me. You can hear my voice, and you need to be able to hear it, I hope, over the roar of the enemy. Look at the difference here. Here's the difference between God's voice and the devil's voice. God's voice is the one that calms you and comforts you. And I love those bottom two, that reassures you and stills you. I love that. Look at these. Look at the last three on the right. The enemy pushes, and he frightens, and he rushes. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere do you see Jesus ever rushing. Don't see it. What a great example. Never will you find in one of the gospel accounts, I got to go. I would love to. I, gotta he I can't heal. I got to go. I got to go. I got to pick some grades. We got to do some stuff. We Don't you know we got to go? Nowhere is Jesus rushing. If you feel rushed and always hurried and always frantic and always spastic and always hanging on by your fingernails, there is a chance you have picked up something in your day that God did not give you. Boom, man, that's good. You need to write that down. I don't even know where that came from. You have probably picked up something that God never assigned you. If your day is so jammed, you know why? Because God always leaves time for himself, always. That's a truth grenade. Man, these are good, Ryan. We should have given these out and put those up. That's good stuff. Write that down. Here's the deal, okay? I'm going to land this plane because I'm running out of time, but this, this is so good. I want to ask you a profound and a sobering question, okay? You can sit back. You can put your pen down. You don't have to write this one down. When is the last time, okay, when you're busy, maybe you were scrolling through your feed one more time or something, when is the last time you stopped and considered the spiritual war that is raging for your heart and your mind. Okay, think about this. When is the last time you stopped and actually fully came to an awareness of the spiritual battle that is raging for your heart and for your mind? The attack that is going right now to chisel away your resolve to protect your rest. When is the last time you looked at that? Listen to how one mom put it. This is, this is incredible. She's a blogger named Christy Straub, and she had this to say. She says, I was shocked. I saw it most clearly on a recent trip to the happiest place on earth. You know where it was. Oh, yes, Disney World, the happiest place. Some of you are nodding, and some of you are scowling. Wow, what a diverse reaction, right? This is an awesome place, and I love to go there when it's not 100 degrees, which leaves me about eight days in January that I can actually go to, to Disney World. She said something was shocking to her. She walked into this place, and here it was, the most magical place on earth, filled with nonstop entertainment and music. It greets you in the bus on the way there before you even arrive, and there's color and lights and music and fantasy and dressed-up characters and make-believe, and it's awesome. And the kids are wide-eyed for a few minutes, and then she said it, suddenly it was astonishing when she got onto Main Street. And she looked around, and she said, adults... And children alike were all walking around, and I quote, in a zombie-like state, staring at their devices. You didn't catch that. 
listen, apparently even Disney World isn't enough for us anymore. What is wrong with us? Think about this. Constant stimulation, music, sights, sounds, food, people, noise, more food, and yet somehow we need more? What? And here it is. Somehow deep inside, every one of us, every one of us knows this truth. What we really need is less. What we really need is to simplify and to hold things loosely, to not chase after every shiny bobble and bangle, and to fill our days with endless pursuits, to feel important, all at the expense of shortchanging our relationship with the Father. That's not what we need. We need less, much less, less stimuli and more serenity. Less screen time, more outdoor time. Nothing wrong with that. Less texting, more talking to each other. Man, people used to pick up the phone and actually call people on it. You remember those days? Like five years ago? It was crazy. Now you're looking, I can't answer that. Why don't you send me a text? It'd be a lot quicker. Less watching, more reading. Less comfort, more exploring. Less apathy and more passion. Here's Here's my favorite one. Less serving self and more serving others. Less of me, more of you, God. That's what we need. Who's with me? Who's with me? Let's pray about it. God, I thank you that you are the God of rest. I thank you that you did not put us on a great big hamster wheel, spin it fast, and just watch us, but you have stepped into the story and showed us by example what we're supposed to do. Holy rest. God, would you help us to seek you and to find you and to protect that time? Forgive us, Lord. Begin with us, Lord. Not anyone outside, Lord. Begin with us. Begin with your church. Forgive us for stacking the deck so full that we can't even hear you speak. God, we're sorry. And in humility, we confess that to you. And Lord, I pray you would restore our strength. Give us stamina for the journey ahead. And Lord, I pray the lost people, our neighbors would see a redeemed people and they would want to know what it is that's redeemed us and we could point them to you. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all know the drill. If you're a visitor, what we do is we sing one more song as we go, and we walk out in victory that God's given us. But the altar's open for a few minutes. If you want to come and pray, you can do that. No one will bother you. We're not going to, like, put a spotlight on you and have a big group gather around you. This is just for you. If you want to stand and sing and worship, you can do that. If you need to talk to me or pray, I'll be happy to be here. I'll stay after church, too. Just be obedient, okay? This is your time, the highlight of our day. Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. Come sing, pray, rest in God, okay? This is your time.